नमस्कार आप देख रहे हैं कॉलर शो लेकिन आज मार्केट्स पे प्रेशर ऊपर दबाव है 9105 के लेवल पे इस समय काम काज कर रहे हैं डे लो पे और हायर लेवल्स पे प्रॉफिट बुकिंग है देखिए सुबह से हम बता रहे हैं कि बानवे सौ का जोन क्रॉस करना मार्केट्स के लिए बहुत अहम था वो हुआ नहीं आज और वहीं पर ही आज तगड़ी कॉल राइटिंग है लगभग सोलह लाख शेयर्स का तगड़ा एडिशन आज के सत्र में जुड़ता हुआ नजर आया बैंकिंग डिसअपॉइंट कर रहा है सीमेंट और साथ ही साथ फार्मा शेयर्स पे आज के सत्र में बिकवाली देखने को मिल रही है मार्केट्स पे आउटलुक बहुत मिक्सड है देखिए इस समय ग्लोबल हेडविंड्स इंपॉर्टेंट है ये एक ट्रिगर है मार्केट्स के लिए जियोपॉलिटिकल टेंशन हावी है ऐसे में कौन से ऐसे ट्रिगर्स हैं जो इंडियन मार्केट्स पे वे कर सकते हैं और क्या बाजार से यहाँ चढ़ेगा इस पे बात करने के लिए मार्क फेबर से आ, सीधा आ, सवाल जवाब करेंगे हमारे एडिटर मेहर भट्ट थैंक्स uh, रजत uh, तो हमारे साथ मार्क uh, फेबर हैं और उनसे हम uh, बात करते हैं मार्क थैंक्स फॉर जॉइनिंग अस प्लेजर एज ऑलवेज हैविंग यू ऑन जी इंडियाज लार्जेस्ट न्यूज नेटवर्क सो आई मीन व्हाट्स योर टेक राइट नाउ आर वी लुकिंग एट बूम डूम ग्लूम वेल इन द लास्ट टू इयर्स मोस्ट एसेट प्राइस आप and uh, starting about 18 months ago some asset prices haven't performed very well uh. high end luxury properties in new york london and uh, other cities around the world singapore hong kong and then the art market has shown some signs of weakness and restaurants in the us car sales in the us so we have a uh, an environment where there is less correlation than there was between 2009 and 2012 13 and i think this offers an opportunity for the active fund manager uh-huh. in other words to look at this year this year there are some stocks that are down on the year uh-huh. and that you know the indian market in dollar terms is up 15% True. So, a clever asset manager, he moved out of sectors that were weakening, and the markets that were weakening, into markets that were strengthening. Among them, uh, as I mentioned, India, and that I think will continue. Uh-huh. There's a lot of liquidity in the world. This liquidity will flow somewhere, uh-huh. either stocks, bonds, real estate. precious metals and uh, it will flow irregularly mm. so one has to be nimble mm. and i think uh, that uh, it's not a question of will the world collapse yes sooner or later the financial system as we have it time <laughs> but you i could have said that already in the mid 1980s mm. and continuous money printing and a debt expansion and then the support by central banks have kept essentially this credit bubble alive and it has made it even bigger one day it will come to an end but it could be in 5 years it could be in 10 years it could be tomorrow we don't know uh, so so mark in that case now you know unfortunately uh, when we speak of indian markets you know the problem is the domestic investor in india or the local investor the native investor he constantly lives in this fear that when the foreign investors will start exiting indian market so you know they constantly have this disbelief that indian market is good or economy is looking good and it will go up as a result what happens is when the foreign investors like you start pumping money generally they are on the sidelines and then they start developing that left out feeling what is because you know past 3 4 months we have seen that the foreign flows have been pretty good in indian market now yes. can we comfortably say that within emerging uh, market bracket india will be one of the top recipients of foreign flows i don't know whether they are a top recipient but say i have a lot to do with international investors and wealthy families and so forth it would not be my impression that they have sufficient exposure to india 
They may own Asian stocks like Hong Kong, Singapore, maybe some Chinese ETFs and so forth, some Japanese shares. But in general, the exposure to India is very small. Mm. And especially considering I have seen studies by PwC, the auditing firm mm. and consulting firm, that essentially in 20, 30 years, India will be uh, the second largest economy in the world. Mm. Uh, that is possible uh, if everything goes well. And under these conditions, I think, if you look at the global stock market capitalization, the U.S. today is 53%. The population of the U.S. is 5% of the world, and purchasing power adjusted, the GDP of the U.S. is maximum, 20%, mm. but maximum. So I would say uh, investors, by and large, are underweight India. It's like, you know, you, I compare it to tourism. How many foreigners travel to India every year compared to, say, Thailand? Mm. We have in Thailand more than 30 million visitors annually. Absolutely. In India, it's a much fewer. Mm. Or you take India, outbound tourism. Mm. In China this year, close to 140 million Chinese will travel outside the country. Right. How many Indians travel outside the country? So all I'm saying is India has a great potential economically provided there is peace in the world and provided uh, the government in India continues on its reform and is reasonable. Mm. That's a big, uh, I would say, precondition <laughs> that you mentioned yeah. that there is yeah. peace in the world. Uh, because that looks very fragile at this point. So, yeah. are we looking at some geopolitical situations spiraling out of control, courtesy Mr. Yeah. Donald Trump, or uh, courtesy the Chinese Premier, or courtesy the North Korean Premier? What's your take? <laughs> the North Korean. He has a very good hairstyle, I have to say. But beyond that, I'm not sure. But look, we're talking here about an investor. Mm. Let's assume everything goes bad. Mm. Uh, if everything goes bad, what do you think is safer? To own the shares of a good company or to own the government bonds of Spain, Italy, the US and so forth? Mm. I think an investor has to say, okay, we don't know about the future. There may be war, the system may collapse and so forth. How do I protect myself best? And here I have to say, if there is really a big problem in the world, I tell you, I think I prefer to be in Indian assets, in Indian real estate, in Indian equities, than say in overpriced US equities and in expensive US real estate and in a very high dollar. The dollar has been, in my opinion, too strong given the fundamentals of the US. Mm. Right. So, you know, you're basically, you look at the world as uh, if everything goes well, okay, my real estate will go up, my stocks will go up, precious metals will go up, and so forth. But if everything goes bad, how do I lose the least money? And my view is simply, for the next 10 years, an investor is better off in, U in uh, Indian equities than in U.S. equities. That would be my view. Mm. Also, now, Mark, you know, uh, this, this entire run-up that we have seen in U.S. markets is actually based on the assumption that the U.S. economy is on rebound and it will sustain its growth trajectory. Now, if you look at the S&P 500 results, the corporate results which have come so far, at least 70% companies uh, in S&P 500 have actually topped their expectation. Would you take any cue from that and maybe expect a sharper recovery in US economy? Or are we at the fag end of the recovery? 
Well, first of all, uh, historically yeah. seen, the recovery is now, I think, 94 months uh, old. Uh. This is, by any standard, one of the longest recoveries in American history. Uh. Usually the business cycle expands for four and a half, five years, and then you have a mild recession, and then, you know, you pick up again. This expansion has gone much longer than uh, other expansions. It's actually as long as the expansion in the 1990s. Mm -hmm. So historically seen, we're in a very mature business cycle. It's been a weak recovery, but in a mature cycle. Number two, if you print money and massive amount of money have been printed in the US and in the in Europe by the ECB and the Bank of Japan and so was that money then flows into the US. In a money printing environment, corporate profits do well. Uh. Uh, what doesn't do well is the standard of living of the typical household. If you ask young people today, and we have precise studies about this in the US, the millennials today at 35 years of age, they have much fewer assets than the boomers had. The boomers are people that are born just after World War II. Correct. And they earn less than the boomers. And the affordability the young people, that is a problem. They cannot afford to buy a house because they have still up to here student debts. Mm. <laughs> because they live in palaces in the US. It's no longer a typical campus. They live in palaces. And so, uh, you know, the, the, the system is not, you cannot judge the system just by the stock market going up Absolutely. And by corporate profits exceeding expectations. Hmm. All I can say is a relatively representative corporation in the US is IBM. Hmm. And IBM has had declining revenues for now five years. True. Through financial engineering, stock buybacks and so forth, they have been able to keep the share price up. And that is a, a factor to consider. In the US, we have a lot of uh, financial engineering. Right. Is it dishonest? Uh, in my view, it's not criminal, but it's borderline. It's not entirely correct. Hmm. Right. What's your take on US dollar <coughs> and gold at this point? Because we have seen a bit of risk aversion, you know, globally the way fund managers have been behaving, and you can sense, you can see some sort of risk aversion. Well, yes and no. I mean, this year there has been a large inflow into equity funds uh. after years of, uh, say, muted activity. And uh, what we also had in the last few years is, as I explained, a lot of money has gone into index products right. and away from active managers. I think that will be in favor for active managers going forward. I think the shift is occurring. But uh, about the US dollar, as I said earlier, uh, I don't think there is a reason for the US dollar to be strong. Uh. They still have a large trade deficit. They have a current account deficit. Uh, the government debt has gone up very substantially, and the Obama basically it's doubled to now $20 trillion. Mm. And believe me, under Mr. Trump, it will continue to go up strongly. Mm. And so I am very skeptical about the strengths of the US dollar. The problem is, if you look around the world, what is better? I thought always that the monetary policies of your former Reserve Bank of India governor, mm. Mr. Raja, um, were the most responsible in the world because he kept interest rates at a relatively high level, mm. which stabilized the Indian rupee. Mm. And by the way, I think the Indian rupee may 
strengthen somewhat more. Uh. So I'm negative about the US dollar now, you know, I read all these reports by currency experts and so forth, and the hedge funds, they go long and short. I can tell you nobody knows for sure because it depends nowadays very much on central banks intervention. Uh, the other day, the pound sterling suddenly shot up. And uh, I can tell you a lot of people were short pound sterling. Uh, so they lost some money. And a lot of people are short the euro. Uh, my sense is the euro is very cheap at this level. Uh, By the way, the pound sterling for the first time I had a beer in London, and the beer was cheaper in London than in the U.S. Uh, in, for the first time in years. But of course, prices will also go up again and so forth. But just to say, the currency markets are very difficult to predict. In principle, I quite like the Singapore dollar and the Asian currencies. And of course, I recommend everyone to hold some precious metals. Uh, that is the, the asset that, in my view, will benefit under any scenario, under uh, any scenario. Of uh, course, there will be fluctuations in the price, but uh, I would recommend any uh, asset holder uh, to hold around 20, 25% of his money in precious metals or precious metal shares, precious metal shares are inexpensive, especially the South African miners, very inexpensive. And I would hold, if I were an Indian, I would think what will grow? Tourism will grow. When people have some more money, they start to travel. They travel overseas, but they also travel for the weekend here and for the weekend there. And then they have a weekend home mm. in the countryside. Because as you know, the large Indian cities are not particularly attractive to live in. Absolutely. So I think that uh, and you have now budget airlines. So it's become much cheaper for someone to move from A to B. And so I believe that uh, real estate in India in selected location is still very attractive. Uh -huh. And so anything related to tourism, hotels, travel agents, and possibly airlines. Uh -huh. So, you know, Mark, last time, in fact, when we had this discussion, <clears throat> that time we did discuss about real estate in India and having some exposure in gold. Now, you know, uh, if you look at Indian markets, the equity markets, uh, some of the heavyweights or I would say the highest weighted sectors are actually not from this arena. So, they are banking, they are IT, they are oil and gas, they are infrastructure. They are the ones who actually drive the index in India. Are you comfortable on these sectors that I mentioned because they are actually the pillars of Indian market, the banking, IT, oil and gas. Are you comfortable on them, these sectors, as far as India is concerned? Well, first of all, I have to point out that I invest globally. Right. And there are some markets uh, that I know more about uh, in terms of individual stocks. Right. But just consider there's thousands of stocks in India. There's thousands of stocks in China. Uh, I cannot know every company in detail. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier on, I think uh, stock selection and the selection of the asset class of the sector will be very important going forward. You see, in India, I can buy Nestle. I pay 50 times earnings. Uh, I wouldn't do that personally. For me, the valuation is unattractive. Uh. And so compared to actually other emerging markets, the Indian market is relatively expensive. Uh. Having said that, there are many companies in India that are not that expensive. And as I told you, if I were living in India, I would buy real estate and invest in real estate related assets in tourism and uh, selectively, you, you know, that it's also like India is a huge country with over a billion people. Uh. So the one state here in the south may grow and another state in the north may not grow. Uh. And so 
there is, like in the U.S., there were times when California was in a recession, but the East Coast was booming. Correct. So we have to be very nimble, as I said, and that we have to essentially uh, select individual companies that will do well and not worry too much whether India will grow at 6% per annum or 6.5% or 5.5% or 7%. Whatever India grows at, it will be much better uh. than European grows and much better than U.S. grows. Uh. Having said that, I'm also buying some European shares uh -huh. because the European markets are not terribly expensive and the euro is very inexpensive. So you get essentially attractive valuations. Uh. Right. Mark, globally, do you like aviation stocks right now? We did hear from uh, another legendary investor, Mr. Uh, Warren Buffet, and he has been, he has never been comfortable on aviation, but lately he has been buying into them. What is your take on aviation globally? Because in India, at least the aviation sector has seen a rebound, at least from stock market perspective. Which sector? Aviation, uh, aviation. airlines. Yes. Well, it's uh, a very competitive sector internationally. Uh. And, uh, you know, I live in Asia, specifically in Chiang Mai, in the north of Thailand, and I travel a lot to Europe. And uh, formerly, there were essentially a few airlines that dominated the traffic between Asia and the Europe, BA, British uh. Air, and you had a Casse, Singapore Airlines, Lufthansa, and Swiss, and so forth. Nowadays, a huge competitor has come from the Middle East, Emirates. True. I have to Bangkok maybe four flights a day, or five flights a day. Uh, I was recently in uh, New Zealand, and I saw on tarmac four Emirates, both, uh, Airbus 380s, four. Mm. These are huge planes, 500 seats each. Right. And then I asked someone at the airport, by the way, does Emirates have a problem and park these planes here? They said, no, 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 no. They come every day, four planes from the Middle East, and then they fly from the Middle East to either Melbourne, Sydney, or Singapore, and then on to New Zealand. And then they stay there for a few hours and fly all the way back. Emirates is the largest international carrier in the world. Mm. And I'm saying this because <laughs> sometimes people in the US and in Western Europe have a very negative opinion about the Arabs, but this is something they did well the promotion of Dubai and Emirates. <laughs> right. So, and then there is Air Qatar, mm. uh, and then there is uh, Etihad, and Turkish Air flies also to Asia. They're rated, highly rated. Then you have Air New Zealand, also highly rated, Kase. So the competition is huge, but the traffic has also increased. Mm. But occasionally, you know, there is a shortage of seats and occasionally there is a surplus. Right. I can fly cheaper. I mean, I fly, of course, first class of business, but I can fly economy cheaper from Bangkok to Europe return than, say, from Zurich to Berlin. Absolutely. One last question to you, Mark. That is a crazy world. You, you understand? But the size of the planes and the planes being much more economical and the price of jet fuel having come have come down and in the middle east they probably don't have to pay anything for the jet fuel Absolutely. and also the, and That's, you have to yeah see that one works thing. for them so and, and also the parking space in the middle east is free of charge absolutely they just build an airport in the desert Quickly, Mark, one last question to you. You know, regarding the uh, some of the policies uh, that Mr. Trump is adopting, like buy American, hire American people, 
the 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 whole issue about h1b which about which india is very sensitive and india is actually taking it up in wto as well uh, what is your take on these policies do they really help so my take is who in america wants to buy american quality <laughs> they want to buy mercedes and bmws and porsches and ferraris if they can afford them and they want to buy you know uh goods from china because nowadays the quality is very good and the price is much lower than from the us so the policies in my opinion are going to be negative for the average household because if they introduce all kinds of taxes for taxes the prices will go up and uh, if the prices go up and we know the wages are not going up much uh mm. the households will be squeezed mm. so i'm very skeptical i but i have to say i would have voted for mr trump because he's less bad than hillary right but as a friend of mine pointed out mm. he is not as bad as hillary but he's working hard on it to become <laughs> even worse <laughs> <laughs> that's a good one we'll leave it at that mark thank you so much for joining us and have a nice day nice Thanks. evening thank you so much